Good evening. Uh, my name is Daniel Diemeyer. I am the Provost of the University of Chicago, and I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us uh, this uh, late afternoon for EPIC's first seminar of the new academic year on the future of nuclear energy. Um, as many of you know, and if you've just been walking down the quad, uh, it's hard to miss it, 75 years ago, University of Chicago scientists achieved the first controlled self-sustained nuclear chain reaction. That experiment and the work that accompanied it and made it possible led to long-term impacts on the field of nuclear physics and engineering and the development of the nuclear power that now accounts for about 20% of US electricity generation and 60% of all carbon-free power generated in the United States. Tonight's event is part of a series of events the University of Chicago is hosting to commemorate that very special event and its all complexity that changed science and our energy landscape. And we're very honored to have with us tonight to mark this historic occasion, one of the nation's foremost experts in energy and national security, John Deutsch, who is currently also a distinguished fellow in residence here this quarter at EPIC at the University of Chicago. Uh, John is one of the people that needs no introduction, but uh, it's my job to give you one anyway. So uh, he has been on the faculty at uh, MIT for 47 years. Uh, during that time, he took uh, leave repeatedly uh, to serve critical roles in the federal government. Um, under President Jimmy Carter, he held numerous positions at the United States Department of Energy, uh, including as undersecretary. And then later, under President Bill Clinton, John served as the Deputy Secretary of Defense and then Director of Central Intelligence. At MIT, he also held many distinguished academic leadership positions, including as Chairman of the Department of Chemistry, Dean of Science, and most importantly, the toughest job of them all, Provost of the University. Uh, John's uh, cross-sectoral research uh, expansively covers uh, areas such as energy security, climate change, uh, energy technology, um, R&D issues, providing insights from a variety of perspectives through a technology policy and international security lens. He'll be providing um, that, these types of insight this quarter to a fortunate group of undergraduates here at the University of Chicago who are taking a class with him, co-taught uh, with EPIC director and BFI director Michael Greenstone that integrates technical and economic analysis to develop an understanding of energy the environment and climate policy challenges. Today, as John talks about the future of nuclear energy, his analysis will be, will be referring back to a comprehensive report he led while serving as the chair of the Secretary of the Energy's Advisory Board, Secretary of Energy's Advisory Board, and uh, he will be talking specifically about the future of uh, nuclear energy and the nuclear program specifically in the United States. We look forward to hearing more about John and his team's findings this afternoon. We look forward to his insights, his analyses on the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for the future of nuclear energy. John, welcome to the University of Chicago and thank you for being here. I hope that uh, I hope that all of you can hear me properly. If not, let me know. I fear uh, that telling you about the future of nuclear energy is a little bit like telling you about the future of John Deutsch. Uh, there's plenty of things to say about the past, but there are some challenges uh, going forward. Uh, I am uh, really extremely pleased to be visiting the University of Chicago. Uh, it is a great university. I, I've known about its Department of Chemistry for uh, decades, as you've heard. Lots of my closest friends graduated from here, as, uh, got their doctorates here, Bob Silby, others. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the f term. I'm looking forward to uh, teaching with Michael Greenstone, despite the fact that he's an economist. I, uh, 
And, I, uh, and I'm happy to be here with you this, this afternoon or this early evening to talk to you about the future of nuclear power. I don't intend this to be a detailed, uh, too detailed uh, presentation. What I hope it does is establishes a basis for some discussion about this important topic and uh, also to uh, hear uh, a variety of views. So uh, let me uh, begin by uh, saying to you, why do you care? Why should one care about nuclear power? And there are really two very, very important issues. The first is that it is a carbon-free generation technology for electricity. It has the potential of being a much larger contributor uh, to the, not only to the United States, but, ar but around the world. So that fact that it is uh, carbon-free is uh, quite important indeed. And the secondly is commercial nuclear power uh, is uh, inevitably intertwined with issues of uh, countries moving towards acquiring nuclear weapons or being in a position to think about acquiring nuclear weapons, especially in the front end of the fuel cycle for commercial power of enrichment and on the back end of reprocessing where you make uh, uh, separate plutonium, which is a bomb usable material. So those two aspects of the technology make it unique from other kinds of energy technology, but also command our attention and say that we should uh, uh, pay attention to it. Well, the question is, what about the nuclear, the nuclear industry today? Let me tell you, it is on its back. It is just in very bad shape. I'll say a few more words about that. But the question comes, what would you need to do and this is the question which Ernie Moniz posed to the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board uh, and said, what would you need to do to revitalize that industry so in a period of 10 or 20 years, we could be back into a position where the United States was building and deploying three to five major nuclear reactors per year, perhaps more than that. That was the question that was posed. Not a question about why do you need nuclear power, that I think one could have plenty of people fill that story in. Uh, but the question was, what does it take to revitalize the industry in a responsible way? In a responsible way. Uh, if you had the ability to do it, what would you have to do? So uh, I want to point out to you that when I joined the Department of Energy as the Director of Energy Research in 1976 in the Carter administration, we were fielding six new or seven new reactors each year. There were four competitive U.S. nuclear reactor manufacturers, Babcock and Wilcox, Combustion Engineering, General Electric, Westinghouse. Today there are zero. So the world has completely changed. I would say that if you looked at the first hundred reactors that were built around the world in the uh, 60s, I would say Probably 80 of them were built by U.S. manufacturers uh, uh, of that total. So we've gone from a position of complete prominence uh, to one where we are basically saying, uh, what's, what, what, what can save us? So this uh, uh, Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, uh, which is really excellent set of people on it, two ex-chairs of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, several nuclear physicists, nuclear engineers, one or two industry experts, inevitably an economist, uh, which in fact was Michael Greenstone. Next slide, please. Next slide. Well, I, do I do that? Mm. That's always dangerous. So uh, here's the outlook in the sketchiest possible term. Uh, we have uh, in the United States allegedly four reactors under construction. Uh, both pairs of them, one in Georgia and one in South Carolina, at the Sumner plant and at the Vogel plant, they're both in a very serious set of, uh, in one case the uh, Toshiba is, is in bankruptcy, in the other case the other is they're out of money. So those may or may not have, they'll probably happen, but they're going to be quite, quite difficult. The, the fifth new reactor is really a restart and it is actually functioning. There are no other planned, no other reactors under construction in the United States. And the way I like to put it is there are not going to be any new nuclear reactors for 10 years or the rest of my life, whichever comes first. 
Um, so that, on the other hand, the same situation is true in uh, Europe. Uh, OECD countries, countries which have market economies, uh, they are not able to uh, get together and decide to build nuclear reactors. There are for a lot of reasons you all come to. So Europe, the reactors are flat. There will be, in fact, net losses in the number of reactors in Europe. The only place where you see reactors being built are in China, India, Russia, and South Korea. These are the countries who are going to be dominating the commercial nuclear industry going forward unless something changes. And there are a host of potential new entrants. Uh, there are the uh, United Arab Emirates, where I believe the Koreans are building their reactors. There are this Jordan, Vietnam, four reactors going up in Turkey with, under a very interesting and complicated arrangement with the Russians. So there's a lot of international security aspects here that when you think about the, the, the important contribution the United States had to slowing the move of commercial nuclear power to uh, illicit means, uh, we have lost, we are losing and have lost a lot of our influence uh, for doing that. So uh, we really want to ask what needs to be done to change that. The next slide, if I can manage this properly, tells you the seven challenges. So our report is really concerned with aiming and, and discussing each one of these challenges. Uh, first of all, it's the cost of the nuclear power plants. Now, very charitably, we say that the estimate of the overnight capital costs to build a reactor in the United States is $5,000 per kilowatt of capacity. I must tell you that those plants in Georgia and South Carolina are coming in at over $8,000 per kilowatt. So these are massively expensive undertakings. If you say, well, what about the rest of the world? Is anybody doing better? Very difficult to know what the uh, reactor costs are in countries like uh, China and uh, Russia. South Korea does have a, more, a, a very much better record, and there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, they only build multiple units on every site. And every design is exactly the same for every reactor. But it's, it's also not exactly clear what the subsidies are, especially on interest in, during construction from the government uh, to explain the costs uh, in uh, South Korea. Um, is there a ringing here? Is it OK? Can you hear? Is it all right? Uh, the third is, uh, what's the competition? Well, you, everybody here presumably knows that we've had a complete revolution in uh, natural gas reserves and production uh, in the North America and elsewhere in the world. I would love to interrupt and give you a separate talk about how important that natural gas uh, revolution is. But the cost now of new electricity generation from natural gas uh, is very much lower. I'll give you some numbers here in a minute very shortly. But it is the competition. That's what you have to beat. And as a matter of fact, it's in the, on the range of a couple thousand dollars per kilowatt as opposed to 5,000. So natural gas is abundant, cheap, and shows every indication, although it's been very volatile in the past, of maintaining that position. The third is a curious thing about what we call our free market economy. And here I want to tell you, the people of Illinois are the worst here. <laughs> that is, uh, you uh, have a regulatory system that allows a reactor to be built, and the regulators, the Public Utility Commission says yes, and the idea is they're going to be paid rates over time to return the equity of the people, the investors who have made the investments in the plants. But for a whole host of reasons, the market structure is such that the electricity from these plants is not dispatched by the uh, utility uh, operators. So you have a situation where you build the plants, and at night, uh, when the wind is blowing, the wind uh, generators will bid negative prices to be able to uh, dispatch their electricity because of the uh, production, the tax credit they get from the federal government for their production. And the poor old nuclear industry, which can send it out at two cents, is not getting its electricity dispatched because the wind is going at minus one cent. 
Now, there are other reasons as well, but the issue about dispatching preferably other kinds of renewable types of electricity uh, is really creating troubles in at least three states. New York, the great state of Illinois, and the questionable state of California. <laughs> uh, each one of these states has taken, I would want to say, duplicitous, concealed you know, uh, steps to uh, protect the existing plants with, which were threatened with closure, of which there were, I guess, three here in Illinois. Uh, the uh, state legislature, I think, has acted to give them some zero emission credits. New York has come up with an even more uh, backhanded way of protecting a few of the uh, reactors there. California has let the uh, reactors largely uh, go, uh, Diablo Canyon. So unless that market structure is fixed, you cannot expect in a market economy, and that may be the problem, that we have a free market economy. If we had some well-run country like, you know, Russia or China, it might be easier to do. But right now, you've got to solve this problem. Very serious issue. And remember, in the United States, because we are, again, regrettably a democracy, it means every one of the 50 states have a different set of rules here. So uh, not true for uh, gas pipelines, but it is true for electricity transmission lines. So the third is this market structure. The fourth is, let's say you wanted the government to help. And while I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, I'm going to tell you this, this doesn't even begin to happen unless the government mounts a very significant program, which I will describe to you, uh, to get nuclear reactors uh, built. Uh, and operating uh, in this country. If that's the case, you have to discuss and think about what kind of a structure you want to have the government have in order to carry out such a program for the development and demonstration and uh, initial operation of uh, nuclear reactors. Safety and licensing. Uh, the United States, of course, is a leader in safety and licensing. But it's important to realize that the cost now, the burden of the cost for uh, safety is extremely large. And we had, as I say, two chairmen, ex-chairmen of the NRC on this group. Uh, it, it, it really, it's a billion dollar deal. That is, it takes about a billion dollars to get your conceptual design uh, partially licensed by the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission to approve that as being a safe way to go forward with a new kind of technology. Uh, fuel cycle, I mentioned that. Our concern began with and is focused on the reactor, but there's a front end. How do you handle the enrichment, especially if you start changing the kind of chemistry, or if I can call it chemistry, which is going out of the reactor, uh, you have a different kind of enrichment problem, and you always have to worry about what you do with the wastes which come out. Let me say that our nation has been visibly and consistently unable to deal with the nuclear waste problem. Uh, when I uh, uh, was in the Department of Energy, my secretary, James Schlesinger, described to me in detail the troubles he had had in Lyons, Kansas, trying to get rid of nuclear waste in the 1950s. We have not made any progress on nuclear waste in this country during my, you've already heard, my considerable lifetime, we've made zero progress. Uh, Senator Feinstein of California, when I uh, testified on this study in front of her, um, she just said to me outright, she's going to vote against every nuclear proposal unless, until there's pro progr progress on nuclear waste management. Uh, the, uh, in the, uh, Steve Chu uh, had commissioned a, a, with Congress, a, 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 a really distinguished committee, co-chaired by Brent Scowcroft and then, ah, I can't remember the uh, congressman from uh, Indiana, who's so, so former foreign, foreign affairs chairman, to do a study about what the nation should do about uh, waste management. It is a fantastic study. It's excellent. Complete blueprint. Very, very, very good. Congress has not enacted any piece of it. So the waste management issue is important. 
And finally, there's this issue of the international linkages. So these seven matters have got to be resolved in a, in a, in a plausible way in order to have the kind of successful initiative that uh, Ernie Moniz was asking for. And moreover, you understand it's going to take a long time to do this. It's not going to be something that's going to be done in 18 months. It's going to have to occur over three or four different administrations. Uh, this just summarizes the difference in the break-even cost uh, of overnight, the overnight capital cost for reactors for uh, natural gas combined cycle natural gas combined cycle, when you now, and I'm introducing a new point, if these uh, cheap natural gas generating technologies, they're still going to be emitting carbon dioxide. So you have to ask, what are they going to do about that? Well, you've got to charge them for the social cost of emitting that carbon dioxide, or they have to capture it and store it forever if you're going to avoid the uh, global warming consequences of their emissions. So there are two different numbers here. Uh, the cost of uh, natural gas combined cycle uh, uh, with and without carbon capture. And then again, because I have to deal with this difficult economics issue, what would happen if you burdened it with a $40 per carbon ton, per metric ton of carbon emissions uh, for the natural gas? And you see the different costs there. Interestingly, photovoltaics, which has now an intermittency problem, it's not a base load generating technology. Actually, if you add a little bit of natural gas with it to carry its intermittency issues, the sun doesn't always shine, you see that it's actually still very competitive. Uh, what, is what is nuclear? Uh, very, very generously, you see that uh, the uh, uh, annual energy outlook of the uh, in Energy Information Administration of the Department of Energy puts it in the range of five grand. Nobody believes it's that low. So that's the first issue, and it looks like a very formidable one. A lot of discussion about this and what to do about it, but there you are. Okay, well, the market issues I've spoken about a lot, I'm not going to go back on it. There's no carbon pricing. That of course, disadvantages both the renewables, but it also completely disadvantages uh, uh, nuclear. There are lots of renewable portfolio standards. They happen to be particularly popular in my state of Massachusetts. If the renewable portfolio standards counts everything which is renewable, except nuclear, they're not included in the renewable portfolio standards. Uh, and as I said, the base load generation is not properly valued. For existing plants, the 100 or so existing plants in the United States, if you want to solve that market problem, it's a question of making deals. You're not going to find one legislative solution that's going to do it for you. You've got to do it case by case, reactor by reactor, congressman by congressman, to, fix the, to, to <coughs> deal with those problems. So uh, you have to really do, uh, you have to restructure the way the industry is uh, handled in its regulatory aspect. So uh, we next now talk, turn now to what about advanced systems? Let's say we'd wanted to do the development and explore the possibility of a new reactor system, a new reactor technology, of which there are First of all, every reactor that, type that you can imagine has been examined one time or another since the 1950s. But now there are a set of them, five or six of them, molten salt reactors, gas-cooled reactors, all of which said could become a new advanced reactor. Perhaps we can sidestep this problem by undertaking a new technology. The current fleet of reactors that are deployed in the United States are all light water reactors, and the bulk of them are pressurized water reactors. So the question is, what about an advanced reactor type that would allow you to circumvent this? So uh, that's what we address. And this is, if you do that, for any reactor type, you're going to have to pass through several expensive and lengthy phases of work, not just talk, work 
to actually define the possibilities of these new reactor types. And here I just mentioned them to you, uh, of which phase two, this component development and getting NRC licensing, at least for conceptual designs, uh, for new designs is important. You have to have a demonstration plant, so you get some experience with operations, so you know that you're, max, you know, you're <coughs> optimizing the way the plant is configured and how it's working. Uh, and then you have to uh, build and start a new first-of-a-kind reactor, and first-of-a-kind things are more expensive than subsequent steps. Each one of these things takes time and money. Now, we had a whole lot of people who knew a lot about this. And uh, when the smoke cleared, their answer was, well, we don't, we're not sure. There are big uncertainties. But the order of magnitude, which everybody, uniform, this is a unanimous, I should say this, people with all different you know, stripes across their heads, different churches, pro-nuclear, environmentalists, regulators, bankers. Uh, all of us were unanimous on every aspect of this report. So, uh, and we said, roughly speaking, 25 years, and then with a degree of precision that is absolutely unjustified, $11.5 billion. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, <laughs> For a guy like me who spent public money in big chunks, $11.5 billion over 15 years is not a, it's not a hard thing to do. I mean, uh, I had to struggle when I was in the Pentagon with the beer $400 billion a year. Today it's $700 billion. My, uh, so uh, 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 that's, that's okay, but it would be a big ask in the kind of political climate that we have in Washington and for the Department of Energy would represent a big chunk, I mean, double their entire energy R&D budget today. And we actually, with a careful discussion that I don't think is necessary, the government wasn't going to pay this out to these bankers, to these uh, uh, companies today to develop it, the whole thing, help them at the beginning when there was a lot of uncertainty in the technology, and over time expect investors take in private equity to come in and, and, and do the bulk of the uh, expenditures towards the end. So we split 50-50, but most of the governments, as you might expect, the government's expenditures were at the beginning where the technical uncertainties were uh, higher. But that's the character. And just to show you that we did work, we spent a lot of time with a lot of experts drawing this kind of illustrative template to show you. You may not, you may not like this template. But then you better get me a diagram which has all these measures on it covered one way or another. And most of the 40 or so companies out there which are looking at new nuclear technologies simply do not have the capacity to produce charts like this at all, much less with any evidence behind them. Uh, and a very interesting discussion on program management. Who would run this program? And uh, we may, people may want to address this, but we wouldn't have it done by national laboratories. We wouldn't have it done by the Department of Energy. We would really ask for the uh, Congress, for a variety of reasons, to establish a, a quasi-public corporation. Up front, give the entire appropriation for the uh, money, the full $11.5 billion. It doesn't mean it would all be spent, but that the corporation would have the management responsibility to decide on the pace and the choices which have to be made along the way to go through this uh, complicated program. There's a whole set of reasons here about why it should be done in this way. And here again, when the question was first posed to the committee, what kind of an organization do you think should manage this if we intended to go forward with it? Uh, there was, everybody was all over the place. When we came out after discussion at the end, everybody was for this kind of arrangement. Interestingly, that committee, which was chaired by Brent Scowcroft on waste management, said that if you really wanted to manage a serious waste disposal program, nuclear waste disposal program, they proposed a very similar structure. You might even consider having one organization do both tasks. But the point is, independent of annual appropriation and authorization cycle of the Congress, independent, having the ability to attract people to do the work different from what you get in the normal uh, government bureaucracy.
Nuclear uh, Regulatory Commission, excellent, the gold standard. They only license light water reactors. So if you go to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and say, here we have a new reactor, for, a new reactor design for you, let's say a gas-cooled reactor or a liquid metal reactor, they say, sorry, we've got to start over again. We don't have the people, we don't have the experience, we don't have the tools, we don't have the data. Very expensive and very time consuming. So some individuals say, well, that's okay. We will go and have our first reactor built in China. That's the popular choice. And the most adventuresome and imaginative people say, we'll have it done, the first reactor built in uh, uh, Indonesia. And uh, the reason is because the regulatory circumstances. But Indonesia has a marvelous circumstance. They don't even have a nuclear regulatory commission. <laughs> That's serious. I mean, uh, uh, so, uh, the, the, but of course, my, my chairs of the NRC point out that if you did do that and you had a successful experience in China or in Indonesia, and you brought your reactor back to the United States, doesn't make it any easier to go through the NRC process. You've got to go through the whole thing. And the NRC is just not in a position to be flexible. And we made recommendations about how they might be more flexible. But this is terribly important. I think I'm almost through my seven challenges. It doesn't look great, does it? International linkages. This just underscores the point, and it's an important point. My friend Dan Poneman is maybe the most uh, eloquent person on this, which says if we are not actors in the commercial nuclear market around the world, we are going to be in a situation where that marketplace might go in a direction which we do not think is prudent from the point of view of our uh, proliferation uh, concerns. So uh, we, are, we are very concerned about that, but you, you can't, you, and the other point is, there's no way for the United States, as brilliant as Argonne is, as brilliant as the other U and DOE labs are, there's no way that they can maintain their influence on that international system without the United States being an active commercial player. And uh, as I mentioned here, we had better be sure, even if we don't build any reactors, that we do everything we can to assure that uh, safety and security are uh, in every reactor that's built around the world. Is it here that I say one reactor accident anywhere affects everybody uh, in the world? I think my last slide, yes, summarizes these points one by one. And I, there are a few. Uh, 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 badly phrased remarks because they are partially what I'm presenting to you and partially what was, comes out of the uh, committee report. But I just want to mention a couple of things here. The first is, through some kind of a very accurate, irreproducible calculation, uh, we say that if there was a 2.7 cents production credit, production payment for nuclear because it was carbon free, or alternatively, there's a 2.7 cents carbon emission charge placed on natural gas generation. The uh, difference in the uh, cost, the overnight capital cost, would be very, very significantly narrowed. So those two things would be one very important. And uh, the second particular point I want to make is the uh, single concept which has gained the most excitement in Washington is the idea of small modular reactors. Don't build those expensive behemoths of 1,000 megawatts or 1,200 megawatts. Build a series of small, you know, like popcorn reactors, and then put them together to get the capacity you need for any particular application you have. That's called the small modular reactor. Now, when we looked at that, actually we looked at this in this report, but we've done an earlier report 
uh, for uh, Steve Chu when he was Secretary of Energy on small modular reactors. And it may be that that is a much more, ultimately a much cheaper way to get nuclear power generation, but there is not a shred of evidence to support that. And in fact, several members of our committee, those who are most familiar with the nuclear industry, basically thought that it was going to be very, very hard to build, to build anything which could beat a light water reactor, as it's presently done. So there's no confidence that you could have that there is a reactor type, or in particular a small modular reactor, that has a hope of coming in at a much lower cost. And here the government is doing something very curious. It's chosen one company to work with on small modular reactors, because it doesn't have enough to, as they did in the 60s, when you had four reactor vendors, to have a competition between their various companies trying to build reactors. They've chosen one company to do their small mod, so they've given hundreds of million dollars to one company. So in a way, what they've done is they've had an auction to choose a monopolistic owner of a technology. It would be very hard for other people to get into this. If this were successful, we don't know that it would be. But that's not the way you, if you are serious about innovation in government, you don't do that by saying, I'm going to choose not a winner in the sense of a technology, but a winner here in the sense of a company. The truth of the matter is, our reactor fleet is aging, starting in the 19. Uh, 2030. Starting in 2030, they are going to be dropping off like flies. They're going to be over 60 years in age. It'll be very hard to get them relicensed. Some of them will require significant amounts of uh, capital maintenance, capital re you know, refreshment. Uh, the uh, fleet of reactors is going to go way, way down. Not only will that affect the number the provost mentioned to us, 19% of our electricity comes from nuclear today in the U.S., but uh, uh, there will be no way to replace that with uh, carbon-free uh, generation of that scale. So uh, if we don't put into place, if the country does not put into place a nuclear program today which addresses these seven challenges in some credible way, come the year 2030, we will not have a nuclear option in this country. Well, I want to conclude with one point, and then I'm, I've spoken too long, and I apologize for that. The, uh, our, our committee was unanimous on all these points. So the last day, we said, well, OK, what should we do about it? If we grant all these points, what should we do about it? And the interesting thing was the committee had no agreement on that point, none at all. And that's also something which made a big impression on me. Some of the members thought, look, this is really uh, you know, a national urgent mission, and we have got to go and build nuclear reactors, whether we do it this way or some cruder way. They thought it was the, uh, especially our lab guys, something so important for the country that had to be done now. Others said, if you put the 2.7 cents charge on the fossil alternatives, then you've got a level playing field. Let it go. And if, they don't, if nuclear doesn't make it, that's what, the way it's going to be. So it's not at all clear, certainly not clear politically, but even among an informed set of people, there's a wide range of difference about what what, what should be done about this very vexing problem, which is really on our table today. So uh, in conclusion, I have delivered to you what I believe is a uh, sad, uh, certainly a pessimistic, but also a fairly realistic view of what has to be done to make nuclear a credible option for this country. I thank you for your attention. I look forward to any comments or questions that you may have. Thank you again for inviting me and letting me be a member of this community, at least for one quarter. Thank you all very much.
please. Sure. Two questions. One, where is your report available? The task force report. Is that publicly available? Uh, uh, unless those uh, new guys have taken it off. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's on the DOE. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's very visibly there, yeah. yeah. Good, because uh, I'd like to use it in our energy course, actually. Oh, uh, the other, you, you didn't mention at all uh, the potential of recycling and the, the the, 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 the back end of getting no. the back end of the fuel cycles in, in a, into a commercial form. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, frankly, we didn't have all the time in the world. We did not do the justice we should have to the front end or the back end, which of course varies with the kind of technology you're talking about. But to cut it short, I have never seen a reprocessing proposal which will ever make commercial sense. Ever, and I've that I that I have followed very closely, uh, and of course you know, metallic plutonium is a perhaps the world's worst atom. So, uh, uh, but I don't know of any way to make commercial reprocessing. It costs more to reprocess a kilogram of plutonium at La Hague in France than to get that to get. Your, your, your heart to get the plaque taken out of your heart. The cost per kilogram is cheaper to get that done than to get reprocessing done. Yes, sir. Thank you. So uh, you gave uh, four steps for new technologies for implementation. Um, do you have a uh, do you have any estimate on uh, time and also a uh, follow-up question, um, what, uh, what specifically what technology do you see having the most uh, promise successfully going through all four of these steps? Um, first of all, the time estimates are on that template I showed you. So the first real pruning might happen after three or four years. You would like to carry a couple of different technologies through that initial period. Uh, and there are six which everybody says are the most likely of the different technology. I don't have them on the top of my head. They're certainly in the report. And they've been extensively studied in uh, both here at Argonne, in what I used to know as Argonne West, but we don't call it Argonne West anymore, uh, out in Idaho. So there are exact, but I don't think, none of them look to me like they're um, clear winners or even close to clear winners. Um, any comments on the, uh, the Canadian experience in terms of how they handle this and their commercial and any thoughts on their, uh, I understand they may have a new uh, uh, nuclear waste facility uh, up for consideration under uh, next to Lake Huron in the next short Next to Lake Huron? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know about. It. I, uh, I can tell you that uh, I could not get my colleagues to even think about the Candu reactor, the heavy water reactors. Now I know that they're working on some new stuff up there at Chalk River, but I, the existing and of course they've had very bad luck with those Candu. I think there are four of them being built in China. They're having very bad luck with them in terms of operations and costs. But I didn't have, there was nobody who appeared before our committee, uh, maybe just was chance, which would, would which argued in favor of the Candu reactor. But I did bring up that. Sorry? Uh, so just maybe an over, I mean, it wasn't an oversight, it may be a mistake. Yes, sir. Challenge number eight is insurance and liability. You didn't address that at all. Could you cover that? Who's going to pick up the tab for the next Fukushima-like event if it happened in the United States? Well, uh, you know, we have Price Anderson, 
and I don't think that there was uh, anybody who was going to say we need more than Price Anderson. There has been some studies done about what your expectation should be on serious accidents. And I guess that uh, I'm now going to use a little bit of my MIT. We, we've done, actually, we've done several nuclear studies at MIT, too. Ernie and I chaired one in 2005. But uh, that, uh, you, you should, that if you look at history, they would say serious nuclear reactor accidents occur once every 1,000 reactor years. Uh, and if you take a look at what people claim for the new generation of reactors, you would say that you should expect a serious accident to one every 10,000 years. But there was no discussion of uh, institutional measures that might be taken. The accidents are going to happen. Yes, ma'am. You had mentioned, oh, sorry. Uh, you had mentioned that um, US nuclear energy prominence has helped us in non-proliferation uh, non negotiations. Could you explain that more? Well, uh, many, many of the reactors uh, are under MB10 agreements uh, so that the reactors are still, because they come from initially US technology, the pressurized water reactors and the boiling water reactors, they cannot, the technology cannot be transferred or used without the permission of the United States. Now, after years and years of this being diluted down through Framatom in France and uh, uh, two or three Japanese, uh, Toshiba and others, uh, that hold is less certain. And by the way, it was also the access to the technology, uh, nuclear engineering expertise that we had at Idaho, have at Idaho and Argonne. But there were legal restrictions which had always been with the, with the licensing uh, uh, of these reactors abroad uh, that have basically gone away over time. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, wow, that's loud. You know what? Uh, I'll just, I'll just speak for a regular voice. Um, there's been a lot of reporting, uh, very optimistic reporting about the potential of SMRs. Um, and I know that there's some in testing right now in Idaho, and the DOE has granted a fair amount of money to some companies researching them, such as New Scale. Uh, but you expressed some skepticism about the technology and the economics of them. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I, let me say what I, what, I, what I want to be careful to say. Of course, since it's a completely different idea, you know, lots of small tomatoes rather than one big, you know, uh, who knows? But I do say this, I think that there's very little evidence to support the fact that necessarily it's going to have a lower cost. In fact, I don't know of any evidence. And I get particularly uncomfortable when people say, well, it's like nuclear submarines, which I know something about. Because in fact, reactors in nuclear submarines are hugely expensive. And the engineering which goes into a nuclear reactor is very different than when you want a commercial power. So I don't think that the uh, naval reactor ex history bears at all on the SMRs. Now, uh, it is true that there's been a lot of effort by the DOE and Congress to support this, uh, I forget the name of the company, uh, in doing this. They've given the money to help them pay these costs to the NRC. And as you said, in Idaho, they have offered them a site for, I believe, the first reactor. Uh, but my real question is, first of all, the size of these reactors has gone up. They're now running against about 300 uh, megawatts per modular unit. So when you start pasting those things together, you end up with a lot more piping and a lot more necessity to manage the heat flows and the fluid flows between them. And so it's not at all clear to me what that cost balance is going to come up. My main point I made here today, which I'm uncomfortable about, if it's successful, you've picked New Scale, I guess is the name of the company, right. one winner with federal money. You have not had a competition between different federal, different private firms competing for a new technology. Yes, sir. John, on the, uh, when the committee looked at this, how do you feel about the, the availability of the skill set? 
in other words, the you know engineers, technicians, scientists, etc., in the United States to support a program like this, or do we need to really worry about educating new class of people to be able to take the program? Uh, I, perhaps naively, I feel very, very comfortable about it, and I would be very, very reluctant about it having a nuclear engineering department at MIT and a nuclear reactor at MIT, uh, I would be very, very reluctant to, uh, at this stage, to um, uh, expand it. But I don't, nobody really said that that was a serious concern. There are many aspects, modeling, simulation, controls, where the whole industry elsewhere has gone so well that you'd, you'd make, some things would be easier. Talking about transuranic chemistry, uh, you're going to go to Argon. Yes, sir. Yeah, Professor Deutsch, <clears throat> you said uh, that, of course, your charge to the CEAB uh, was about how to do it and that uh, the reason why... No, the uh, reason whether. We are, we have, yeah, yeah, the yeah. weather, but the reason why we should do it, um, you know, people can talk about that, but given the set of information that you've provided, isn't the question why we should do it something that um, we should talk about? Because if there are reasons that are not just directly discussed here, then one might envision it. But one reason that adds to the side of not doing it is if we're trying to make a difference in carbon emissions within 30 to 50 years, um, that's really beyond, uh, this is beyond the time scale where at least in the US anything like that can can make much of a difference. So I guess I'm asking you to, uh, given that uh, you've shown we're in a deep hole here, uh, what other countervailing reasons on the why side would make it worth trying to solve this problem? So uh, first of all, uh, you know, these global warming figures that we see uh, they all stop at 2100. They just stop. I mean, that's where all the uh, representative concentration profiles go out to. But the problem of carbon or greenhouse gas don't stop at 2100. So uh, I'm, you say there's not enough time. The further out you go, the more the choices are going to get restricted. And a big, robust, high-capacity, carbon-free generation were it affordable, uh, would still be to me a very compelling, compelling thing. People can differ on that. People can say, you know, we're going to go to a distributed generation type of technology, utilities will disappear. A lot of people believe that. But uh, I think it's an extremely important deal. My problem is that when I draw out the challenges and ask how would I go about overcoming them, I find that even in this rather, as you, as you properly say, narrow view, five reactors and starting in 2030, that's not going to make a big difference. Uh, when we did our study at MIT in 2005, we asked for a tripling of the uh, deployed nuclear reactor fleet across the world by the year 2050. And it's going to happen. So you've got a good point. But boy, do I don't see anything better. Even I don't see this working. I don't see anybody. Yes, sir. I can be loud. Uh, can you speak a little bit to fusion and how the waste-free benefit versus the upfront investment would uh, go? Is I nobody. My problem with fusion is what happened to me in 1970 six or seven. I was director of energy research and uh, the uh, Princeton Fusion Lab decided at a time when its budget was being considered on the Hill to go to the newspapers and describe a great new advance at the Princeton Fusion. This is going to be a long story, but it's made an imprint on my mind, as you will see. Uh, the Secretary of Energy, who was Jim Schlesinger, not a soft boiled egg called me into his office and he says, close the lab and stop the fusion research, full stop. Do it. 
Uh, by the way, I was his favorite. He only gave me the interesting things to do. Uh, and I said, no, 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 I got to push back. I got to get him to change his mind. So I uh, went and I got three people. You're probably the only guy in the room who's, excuse the expression, old enough to remember them. Johnny Foster, Saul Buxbaum, and uh, Mike May, and said, come and do a, a real study of fusion. And these guys worked furiously and produced a 20-page report which talked about future possibilities for fusion. And these are very sophisticated guys. These are not, you know, they're really smart and capable and proven. And they gave me this 20-page report. And basically, the last diagram says, here's what's going to happen. It's competition between magnetic fusion and inertial confinement fusion. In 1980, that was a penultimate, we will have a prototype operating reactor of fusion in 1980. I carried it to Schlesinger's office. I said, Jim, we just can't do this. Most brilliant set of guys. You know them all. They're terrific. We're going we're to follow this program. He said to me, get out of my office. You never listen to me. Go away. That was, in, you know, that was 1976. I'm sorry, maybe it was 2000 that they said this. In any event, not a chance. I mean, we're way beyond that. I do not know of anybody who's given me a credible plan for fusion that has any chance. I've never seen it. And, we're way, and we spent a lot of money on it. So I, 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 I'm just not your guy on fusion. You've got to get somebody younger, <laughs> less experienced. Oh. But I, I don't, I don't think, you know, there are some interesting ideas out there, but boy, it's really, that's really brand new. Yes, sir. So you've laid out this very uh, analytical and fact-based approach to thinking about the challenges. Uh, and I know that there were also policy recommendations. But I guess you, know, you personally, as you kind of think about your, your perspective and having gone through this study, uh, and I look at that last line there, uh, we don't do something along the scale and scope of what the, the CF outlined. We have no nuclear power option by 2030. How much does that concern you if you think about uh, the, kind of, the kinds of policy goals that we have, tackling climate change and those kinds of things? I mean, do you, do you feel like uh, if we don't do this, we won't, we won't be able to uh, tackle those challenges? Or do you feel like it's just a question of, uh, well, you know, how, well, uh, uh, first of all, I should say when I, I gave a very much, maybe even many of these slides, uh, to the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee with Diane Feinstein and Lamar Alexander there, uh, they were, uh, Diane Feinstein says, if you made some progress on waste, I'd be with you. If you don't, forget about me. He said, I'm all for it. So uh, I think that there is some prospect if you could solve some of these problems. But politically, it's extremely hard. You know, there's no industry here. You don't have a lot of labor interests. You don't, you know, these are all now foreign firms fooling around in this. Um, what does it mean for climate change? I don't think it means much for climate change. But it does mean that one option, one pathway for dealing with maybe 20% of the problem is closed for us and for the whole world. So that's, that is significant. There are not that many pathways. And throwing away one which is 20% wide is a, a real bit. I think that that's what it means. It means that you, you are not only going to have to, you know, you're not going to have a 20% to grow, you're going to have a 20% hole in the United States that has to be filled. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm curious how this report's vision for the future of nuclear energy, the recommendations that you've made, is compatible with the recognized need for a modernized grid that's responsive to the fluctuations in load, demand, and supply coming with climate change. Um, it is, I think, orthogonal to that question. I think that the issue of grid stability 
and the modernization of the grid and what form the grid will take is in fact, uh, an, first of all, it's an issue which is bigger than this. It's going to happen. But whether you have nuclear there or not, I think is not critical. I mean, I don't think it's really necessary to have nuclear for stability of the grid or anything like that. It's a very good point because to the extent that you develop the grid so that you can do the electricity delivery that citizens want, you're lowering your total demand for electricity generation. That will help on the uh, carbon emission side. But I don't think that this is really directly related to it. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, the answer is the reason you care about that is because it has a nuclear weapons implication, not immediately. But, uh, you know, China is uh, going to build the next four reactors, I think, in Great Britain. And they're doing that not on the basis of their technology, but on the basis that they're also going to do the financing for it. The uh, deal that the Russians made in, it, in, in Turkey, which is much more interesting, is it was a make by own contract. That is, they would make the reactor, build the reactor, operate the reactor, own the reactor, take the waste away. The Russians are the only people who will take spent fuel away. And all that the Turkish government would do would give them a promised kilowatt hour charge. So they, they are now providing all of this with four reactors built in Turkey, operated in Turkey, and owned by the Russians in Turkey. And they sell on a contract, a long-term contract to the Turks. Now you can say to me, John, what would happen if the Turks didn't pay their contracts? But that we need to talk about in a smaller group. But you know, the South Koreans are doing it. Uh, the South Koreans, I believe, are building the reactors in uh, um, Dubai. Thank you all very much. Oh, one last one here. I just wanted to, can you hear me over here? Absolutely. I want to make one little There's a big utility that was one of the, you just touched on it before, it was a low, low growth. I mean, it is quite aside from nuclear, low, low growth. The company is becoming more efficient. It's a good thing overall. It's an individual company that's a problem. And if you combine that with the inability to control capital costs of building Very hurtful what you just said. You gave my talk in much less time than I. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much.